Uh, welcome to uh, the PGC Worldwide Lab Meeting. Um, the participants will, will typically trickle in and stuff with time, but we'll get started now. Um, and this is being recorded. Um, we'll post it on, on the, uh, the PGC site later on. Okay, so this is, uh, we're doing something a little bit different. So instead of having um, a one hour uh, single topic thing, um, we've had a couple of sessions now about new resources. Um, the previous one um, covered um, uh, a new protein-protein interaction database, as well as a new synaptic set of annotations. And today, we're super, super pleased to have Yun Li and Kyoko Watanabe to talk about two um, other um, data types uh, and data resources um, that are, I think, of great interest to the PGC. Um, our first speaker will be my colleague at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Yun Li. Um, Yun trained with, um, uh, with Gonzalo Bicasis and has been at UNC for six or seven years now. And she actually wrote Mock, the impute program that we, that we all use or have all used. Um, and today she'll be talking about her work on high c the, the way to look at chromatin interactions. And then she'll speak for 25 minutes, five minutes for question. And then the second half of the hour will be Kyoko Watanabe, who's in Daniela Postuzma's lab at, uh, at the university, uh, at, at FU University in Amsterdam. And she'll be talking about the FUMA resource. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we're gonna start with Yun, and at this point, Yun, I'll turn this over to you. If people have questions, um, there's several ways to either put something in chat box or use the Q&A box, and we'll make sure your questions get answered. So, without further ado, let's turn it over to Yun, please. Hey, thanks a lot, Pat, and uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, to this group. So I will uh, talk about, as Pat indicated, uh, a, a, a new type of data, a high C, uh, that people are probably not too familiar with, uh, so it's a relatively new data type looking at uh, chromatin three-dimensional organization or chromatin 3C, uh, 3D uh, structure. And uh, I will focus in on the web tool, a web browser that we have recently developed that we call QGIN. And uh, you can see the, uh, where the short name, the abbreviation comes from, it's high c Unifying Genome Interrogator. Um, but then, you know, like uh, I have a lot of slides in, uh, in my um, PowerPoint. Uh, so, you know, like I will skip through quite some and focus on only you know the most important aspects I feel um, but you know like uh, uh, I'm free uh, you know I'm uh, very flexible in terms of taking questions afterwards and uh, offline um, so uh, um, going to the next slide so uh, the uh, the this slide and the next basically gives you a little bit of history of how we you know like where, where you know the name comes from why we come up with this uh, you know like a name so uh, the huge in uh, actually comes from uh, Norse mythology it's a name of a ribbon uh, on the shoulder of a god and it means uh, uh, thought and we do have another uh, uh, tool or uh, uh, that that way it's a more statistical method called muni but you know that's a uh, a side story. So there are two different spellings, sometimes with the NW and sometimes not. Uh, so the work was published uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, summer last year, um, in bioinformatics. Um, uh, my post uh, Josh uh, being the first author and uh, so just a, a few you know like a really uh, very brief a true bullet version of what uh, this huge browser does so it's a very handy online visualization tool for uh, looking at uh, uh, high C data uh, it's you know again look at crunching spatial or 3d organization and uh, the good part of a huge is that it holds data that are multiple cell lines and multiple tissues, uh, currently all in human. And uh, the second bullet point really, you know, for, for us that uh, we care most about uh, for, you know, like a, a similar as, you know, uh, for, for me as well, you know, uh, that's how I got started is for, you know, interpretation of GWAS results. So we have found, you know, tens of thousands of uh, uh, GWAS variants that are reproducible, replicate, uh, rep, uh, reproducible and, uh, you know, like you see the replicated in other cohorts and with the very small p-values. So we believe they are true. I mean, associations are uh, true, uh, but then like a uh, uh, you know vast majority 80 90 percent easily uh, you know residing in non-coding regions so what do we do uh, with them and do you know what's the mechanism and things like that so huge is uh, developed that basically for uh, specifically for GWAS variant interpretation um, uh, in in particular like a uh, two related uh, things so first is targeted gene or targeted genes identification say if we believe you know a gene reside a, a SNP resides a GWAS SNP that we identified resides 
it's in the you know regulatory region with all those what I call the Wendy uh, epigenomic uh, um, uh, footprint annotations like you know people trying to uh, K, K, uh, uh, K27, Cytomark, and things like that. But what gene or genes does it regulate? Uh, so uh, huge in or high seed data uh, helps uh, answering this question. And then with that, uh, we can you know prioritize in terms of uh, functional follow-up experiments. So that's a very short version. Now uh, let's get uh, um, you know let's go on with the, the actual huge in browser and first the interface. So this is uh, uh, rather you know like a um, big picture view of what the, the interface and on the upper left hand corner we have our logo again it's a ribbon and then look at the uh, crumpting uh, 3d structure so we have uh, the you know double helix here um, so and uh, give a very brief uh, introduction of what it does and uh, so here's uh, the, uh, the bottom part is uh, um, mid and bottom part are uh, it's the interface and to the, to the bottom I have a very big bound I have the URL so you can have a try yourself and then in the next couple of slides I will basically zoom in each of the section um, so before that um, so the uh, the data uh, underneath the huge um, server were also previously published so in uh, cell reports uh, so it we call it a compendium of crunching contact maps, uh, reviews the spatial active regions in the human genome. So it's uh, all the data were generated by my close collaborator, Bing Ren, uh, lab. Uh, so as I mentioned briefly, uh, it, all the data currently are human, and there are seven human cell lines and 14 human primary tissues. So before we published our paper, the only tissue high C data uh, was uh, generated by Dan Gashu and the group in brain only. Uh, so we cover, you can see you know like uh, uh, among the 14 tissues various uh, you know like uh, layers of uh, uh, of the tissue you know like uh, uh, the brain uh, you know like a uh, long uh, liver you know like uh, um, uh, bladder ovary and, uh, and things uh, so so that the before ours uh, the the Gashwin group was the only one that during high C data in tissue and in brain only that was published actually the same year in September 2016 um, so and uh, our that this piece of work the data underlining huge gene actually was uh, highlighted by Nature Reviews Genetics uh, for generating this you know like a big very resourceful um, uh, you know data in uh, and also uh, for a concept that we uh, presented uh, in the paper called Fire you will see. Uh, later on a little bit of mention of that uh, abbreviation for frequently interacting regions so looking at uh, you know regions of the genome and sliding window view in this case asking you know are you in contact uh, with a lot of your neighbors here contact means uh, you know like a 3d proximity and uh, uh, so as promised, uh, so here's a zoom in view of the different parts of the interface. So the uh, the, the top part, of course, you know, a brief uh, brief introduction, and then give uh, give you a link to the uh, rather complete tutorial page. And then the most important part is actually the the very top part uh, with the information type. So it's a, a presentation. Uh, it's like uh, the type of presentation that uh, you want to see um, to, to visualize the high C data behind the huge gene. Uh, so default is the so-called virtual full C plot. Uh, so I mentioned a high C a couple of times. So high C data um, uh, derives, so it's uh, generated by the high C technology and high C is a, a, a derivation of a so-called 3C or conform chromosome conformation capture technology, so 3C. And then the, the 3C is a father of all the so-called C technologies. And then there's 4C and 5C and high C. Uh, so 3C is looking at one-to-one, -one, meaning that you're looking at one particular gene segment and see if it's in contact with another one uh, uh, DNA segment. So it's, that's why it's one-to-one. -one. So you need to design probes for uh, both um, uh, uh, you know, like uh, segments that you are interested in, so that's determined a priori by the investigator. Um, and then four C is the so-called one to many in contrast in contrast to three C one to one. So we look at one particular uh, segment, uh, call it the anchor. Um, basically, and you want to look at its uh, physical, uh, its 3D, you know, like a contact with many other DNA segments. So that's called one to many. A lot of the time, you look at, you know, like 
like a neighboring regions. Uh, but if you know you look at a particular anchor that's say you know like a 10 uh, 40 kb, and you, there are many you know other 40 kb. Say if you want to look at you know 100 uh, you know uh, megabits uh, above and below, and then you have you know about 200 uh, uh, you know 25. Uh, yeah, 25 uh, uh, such, you know, uh, 40 kV beans upstream and downstream. So it's looking at uh, this particular anchor bean and with, uh, you know, 25 up and 25 uh, uh, beans downstream. So that's virtual 4C. So, uh, that's 4C, so one too many. So virtual 4C, you know, it's because we generated a high C. High C, you know, in contrast to 3C one to one, 4C one too many, and there's also 5C, many to many. And high C look at so called all to all. So we're looking at oh, generated genome wide data, so all to all. But then, you know, like if we're interested in a certain SNP, a certain region, and the best way to visualize it is to, uh, you know, subsect or extract a part of the data and visualize it centered at this anchor point. So, uh, so that's creating so called virtual 4C because we're looking at this anchor uh, and uh, this particular one to many. Uh, uh, regions nearby. So, uh, anyway, so that's a oops, long introduction to this part. Um, uh, but like uh, the default uh, information type is virtual 4C, and uh, uh, pretty much the only thing you need to input uh, or need to put into QG is this anchor position. So. Um, a lot of times, so for me, it's just a SNP uh, that uh, we have identified from GWAS. But it can it can be you know like a, a chromosome position or even a, a, a range. Um, and so and then you hit run and all the other things are pretty typical for you know like a. Uh, for genome browsers. And then uh, the next section basically lists all the data types, again, okay, you know, seven human cell lines and uh, 14 primary tissues, and you can uh, select one, many, all, blah, blah. And then uh, at the bottom, list all the, you know, like a uh, you know, like uh, the readouts from uh, the high C data and uh, other, you know, related, uh, you know, epigenomic data. So, for example, uh, you know, we have uh, RE seq for all the cell line and the tissues. So you can turn on the gene expression profile. And then I mentioned the fire. So that's one of the readouts from high C data. And then uh, you can also uh, and tag the topological associated domains if people are familiar with. It. So that's another readout from high C. And we have also generated uh, uh, several histone chip seq data. So you have have the enhancer uh, uh, marks as well, and also CTCF chip seq data we have for some. And uh, there's also, oh, sorry, this enhancer is from previous, uh, uh, like an encode epigenomic uh, roadmap. Uh, so there's uh, super enhancers and typical enhancers. And then, uh, oops, uh, the chip seq. Uh, data are the, you know, there are several histone chip seeks data uh, that we have generated. And then you can also, uh, you know, have, have a tags for the G1 SNPs, which I seldom use. And you can pretty much ignore the last one for now. And uh, then, uh, so uh, then we'll give, uh, let's see, um, 10 minutes into my talk. Uh, so, um, I will give basically two or three examples that showcase how you can uh, use the uh, use in the Hugin server. Uh, the first example is uh, uh, for a study of blood cell traits. Uh, so we published the uh, article in uh, in Nature Genetics and found a particular SNP, this RS25 blah blah, uh, which corresponded to this purple dotted line here uh, that associated with the platelet count, um, and then like a you know, like uh, it's typical in GWAS, once we find uh, a SNP, and this SNP happens to be intergenic, as you can see from here, and it's in between a gene called PWP2A on its left, and then FAB P6 on its right. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, typically, if you have no information at all, people would assign it to the nearest gene, in this case, it would be PWP2A. And, but then, you know, like uh, the, uh, we checked at that time, uh, you know, like uh, the blueprint blueprint epigenomic project there, uh, you know, like a full C data. And then we actually found a physical interaction, again, you know, like uh, in terms of 3D distance, there's there in three-dimensional proximity uh, between this SNP and the promoter region of this CCNGL gene that is further uh, to its right. And then you can see that it goes, this gene goes in the negative strand. So the uh, the five prime end of the promoter TSS is actually even further right, uh, down, down to the right. Uh, so reading from the uh, scales, you can see it's actually, you know, like uh, um, uh, over, um, uh, over 100 KB away. And, uh, uh, um, and then if you look at, uh, and if you look at our data, we also see, uh, you know, long-range uh, chromatin interactions 
between uh, this uh, uh, SNP, the, between the region the SNP resides and the promoter region of the CCNGL. Uh, but you know, most strongly in GM, uh, GM cell, so in the LCL, GM 12878 uh, cell line, in contrast to I show here another two tissues, uh, hippocampus from the brain and the uh, uh, liver. Uh, so let me orient you of, uh, you know, this is one of the, you know, key plots uh, that are shown here. Uh, this one is slightly different from what you actually see, but for the other examples, you will see the actual screenshot. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the y-axis are the counts on the left end, and uh, the, uh, on the right, it's a negative long term of the p value. So the, uh, the right y axis and correspond to the blue lines here, which again, you know, shown as the, uh, as a bigger legend. And then the counts correspond to the uh, black and the red lines with the black showing the observed counts. So it's observed read counts that were generated from data. And then the red line expected counts. So those are calibrated from data, taking into account, uh, you know, the distance between the pair of uh, DNA loci and the consideration and also, uh, you know, GC content and, uh, you know, mapability and things like that. And the length of the, uh, of the segments, if uh, the, the, the segments are of a different length. And uh, so basically, you can see uh, that we basically found, uh, uh, you know, from this kind of virtual fussy plot, uh, we want to see, uh, you know, like um, uh, basically, you know, like a big spikes, big blue spikes. So those are indicated like a small key values. And but you have to pay attention to the to the scale or the uh, maximum of the right wax. So for example, in GM and LCL here, uh, the the biggest p value, the smallest p value is uh, you know to the negative si uh, seven. Uh, but you know here hippocampus, you seem to see a spike. But if you look at the scale, you know like uh, what you see is one. So this p value is just uh, you know barely you know like uh, uh, smaller than point one. So it's not significant at all considering the multiple testing. And then in liver, that's even more pathetic. So everything you you see here is actually with p value bigger than 0.1. <clears throat> uh, so you know, like in in, in GM, we see the p value slightly smaller than 10 to the negative four. So there's a strong a strong. Uh, strongest evidence here. Uh, so, and, and then there are some other evidence to believe that this SNP does reside in the regulatory region and does seem to uh, regulate the expression of this CCNGL gene, but not the other two genes nearby. And then just looking at, uh, you know, like uh, another type of data that, uh, you know, we can use to identify targeted genes, which is the EQTL data set. And so we check the GTEx, for example. And then, uh, so, so basically in the parentheses, so we show, you know, like the G tax if uh, uh, if the the particular cell line is not available in in G tax because G tax are all tissue based uh, and then the p values in each of the sub figure and the underlying each gene are the p value for EQTL they have nothing to do with the high C data so those are 0 0.99 0 0.34 etc for EQTL, uh, GTEx EQTL p values. So basically, checking out the p values, you can see that it's not significant. None of them are significant. None of the three uh, nine p values are significant. So uh, basically, this SNP was not identified as a target. Target uh, was not identified as EQTL for any of the three genes in any of the three cell line uh, tissues here: uh, whole blood, hippocampus, or liver. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's only identified EQTL uh, for uh, for the the uh, Fab B6, P6 gene in skin uh, and uh, thanks exposed to the lower leg. So that's the only thing uh, that identifies significant. So you can argue it's either wrong gene or wrong tissue or both. Uh, so that's the first example. So it show basically help you identify the uh, the uh, the targeted gene, which is a much uh, which is not the closest gene, but you know we have supporting evidence. Uh, but in contrast, the EQTL uh, failed to do so. Um, and uh, of course, you know, there's uh, uh, drawbacks of each method, but uh, what I'm trying to say is like uh, they can be used as complementary information. And then there's another view. So the default view is of virtual policy, but there's another view, which is a heat map view. Uh, so we developed this view, uh, particular because we have, you know, like uh, um, uh, seven cell lines and 14 primary tissues. And you can easily see from here, okay, we have a lot of information. We can see how many counts are there and what's the p-value. That's great. But then, you know, 
I can only comfortably fit, uh, you know, three cell lines or tissues in one slide. In contrast, the heat map, I can easily fit, you know, a dozen uh, or more lines. Uh, so here, you know, like I use uh, the, the evidence are showing in dots. And then the, the darker, uh, the redder the color, uh, the higher the signal to noise ratio signal uh, observed as measured by observed over expected counts. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, oh, sorry, that's the size. And the darker the dots, uh, the more significant the p-value is, as indicated by the, uh, the legend right here. And uh, uh, so I'm done with my first example. So, you know, with that, I pretty much, you know, should explain the most important part of the virtual policy plot and give you a little bit, uh, you know, like a um, uh, um, idea of what the, um, you know, like a heat map view looks like. And now moving to the second example. Uh, so it's another GWAS SNP identified to be associated with the risk of type 2 diabetes and also associated with the uh, 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 blood uh, blood uh, at levels, and this gene uh, and this SNP is a uh, intronic SNP. It's in it's in uh, the intron of a gene called ARL15. So again, you know, like uh, uh, if we uh, if then GWAS is just focusing on the you know like uh, uh, association parts, and uh, if, if we have no other information, try to uh, you know like uh, figure out what is the potential target gene. We'll probably assign it to the AR15, right? <laughs> so uh, with no other information at this point, we'll probably say, oh, the potential target gene is the AR15. You know, like this SNP is intronic in this gene. But now let's look at the, uh, the what Hugin would tell you. Uh, so this is again uh, th this now is the real screenshot. So this is exactly what you would see if you just uh, uh, do one single thing. So just uh, you know like uh, paste the name of this snip into the um, and the anchor position uh, box that I just text box I just showed you at the very beginning. Uh, and this is what you'll see. Uh, of course, you need to do another thing is just to select these three you know like. Uh, this one cell line, those two tissues. So you only need to do the two things: paste the marker name into anchor position, and then select the uh, the three uh, you know things, uh, the tissue uh, cell line tissues I selected, and then you will see exactly what see, what I see here, except the Y max thing that <laughs> I highlighted. Uh, so you can uh, so again, you know, as I indicated, you know, you have to pay attention to the scale of the right Y axis. So here it goes up to thirty eight. So it's very significant to to up to uh, you know like a uh, up to 10 to the negative 38. And then here it's uh, it's still okay, it's into negative 12, but you know, much uh, less, uh, you know, much less significant results. And in spleen, the biggest one only goes to, to four, so everything is below, uh, uh, every p-value is bigger than 10 to the negative four, basically. And so, okay, now let's focus on the data. Again, I said, you know, we're looking at uh, those big blue spikes for, you know, significant interactions. Again, you know, it's virtual 4C, so everything you see basically has a fixed one point. So we're looking at interactions with uh, this SNP, or rather, you know, because of resolution, the, the current data are at 40 KB resolution. So we're looking at this particular 40 KB beam that this SNP resides. So, you know, like it's virtual C again, you know, uh, everything you see is the evidence of interaction of uh, each beam with this particular, you know, like a uh, shaded uh, gray bean right here where the SNP resides. So we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, big blue spikes. And so, you know, you see one here and uh, uh, potentially one here. But again, you know, we are not only looking at uh, big blue spikes, but we also look at them at the, uh, you know, like most easy, uh, easiest to interpret positions, basically upstream of genes. Uh, this one is, you know, uh, uh, inside the the, the, the AR15, the gene body of AR15. So I don't know how to interpret that. So, uh, so the idea is like we're thinking this SNP is playing regulatory role, basically, you know, serving as an enhancer to regulate the genes. So we expect it to interact uh, with, uh, you know, the promoter of a gene. Uh, that's why we're looking at a five prime upstream. And uh, so the only thing. Excuse me, Yun. Just wanted to point the time. It's uh, okay. 25 after. Okay. I should be done soon. So I will uh, just uh, uh, finish this example and finish the other uh, two data types uh, possible and then I will be done. Um, so uh, so basically here, you know, this is a particular, uh, you know, uh, this is a gene that has strong evidence and there's another, you know, mid sized gene in between the SNP and, uh, and uh, this potential targeted gene based on high C data. 
Uh, but you know, like uh, I, I don't show the three prime end of the AR15, but there's no evidence of interaction with the AR15. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, evidence in both the uh, embryonic stem cell H1 and uh, also some in the liver. Um, you know, still quite strong, tend to negative trial, it's quite strong, but not insulin. So it's not uh, uh, constitutive or Cross all tissues, but at least in you know liver, uh, you know it's considered quite relevant for you know obesity related traits. And this is the heat map view, so I fit it in all the 21 cell lines and tissues. So um, uh, the last example, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, so to finish up, now with the high C data, what would you guess? I and mean, it's pretty obvious to me, uh, the FST gene, uh, that is much further, uh, you know, to the left. Um, uh, I think it's uh, over 400, over uh, 700 KB away. And then, so I will get that, guess that. And then we also, uh, based on the data we generated, uh, EQTL data or gene expression data, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, like a subcontinuous adipose tissue gene expression uh, data. So, and using that, we found uh, uh, this SNP is indeed an EQTL for FST, but not for RR15. So this is also consistent with our conclusion from the HiZ data. So now at this point, uh, I'm pretty confident that the targeted gene is probably most likely to be FST, Though the the SNP is in tronic in FTO uh, in 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 AR15, uh, so uh, I'm skipping the last example, but that's a famous example, probably a lot of you are aware of. So it's first published in 2014 in Nature. So two FTO in tronic uh, variants actually controlling the expression of RX15 that's still you know also much further uh, away from the SNPs rather than FTO gene that they actually reside. Uh, so I'm skipping this example. Uh, but this is just uh, uh, giving you an idea. And then, you know, some additional, you know, marks I mentioned, uh, you know, chip seek marks and then where the fires are and where the uh, super enhancers and typical enhancers are. Um, and, uh, you know, I highlighted the fire concept in case you uh, care about. And then, you know, one of the obvious things is, you know, with the high C data, you can also, you know, like identify the targeted genes for each of the SNPs you identify, and then you can perform better gene set enrichment test and uh, here you know like uh, I'm just uh, showing you like uh, you know like uh, uh, by looking at uh, several different uh, you know diseases uh, um, we show that huge in a sign um, you know like a um, sign you know a much a uh, smaller percentage of genes to the nearest genes in terms of one dimensional distance in contrast to what's uh, in the GWAS catalog. And the overlap between the, you know, the huge assigned gene and the GWAS catalog assigned gene is actually pathetically overlapping, so less than 15%. So they are at least very different. So we need to be really cautious. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned, you know, like I already showed you a lot of virtual 4 C plot, and I also showed you a heat map. And there are two other data maps that are available output that you can get out of our huge, uh, you know, like a server. Uh, one is the uh, text information. So basically, showing here, uh, you know, like uh, if you just scroll down, there's uh, all four of the selections. So basically, you know, for for uh, this is uh, basically the format you get for each of the cell line. And and uh, you get three pieces of information of the count expected on the long term of p value, and then like with each of the uh, the segments of the gene, um, um, and then you can save that to a file. And now the last uh, uh, output, which is uh, association, so you can you know pick the SNP or SNPs or regions of interest, and then we'll give you uh, you know like a, just a zoom in a little bit. Uh, th this is the SNP you put in and where it's located, and what is the most likely target gene, and uh, with the evidence in terms of uh, you know in parentheses log term p value slash observed count slash expected count. So uh, so that's the last view, and uh, in all the cell line or tissues that you selected. And so we are planning to incorporate more data. One of the things actually is generated in collaboration with the PET lab. Uh, so we have uh, you know, three adult and three fetal brain uh, tissues. And uh, uh, for each, we have around uh, one, one, one billion raw rates. So together we have over 10 billion raw rates and uh, several other things that we're going to uh, incorporate. Uh, that regular high C or, you know, like a uh, plexic high chip type of data that, that we're planning a lot of in collaboration with the Beerings lab. Uh, so, you know, like I'm uh, skipping all of those, uh, but, you know, brief summary is like, so we have this uh, uh, very handy online visualization tool uh, to help people uh, identify potential targeted genes uh, uh, in a very tissue or cell line 
in a specific manner. And so we have those four different output formats, you know, virtual policy, map, association, and, uh, uh, what's the other thing, table. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of data and we plan to add more. And, uh, and I didn't talk about that, you know, but we have developed methods to call those peaks. Uh, so, so it's, uh, you know, rigorous statistics and also multiple testing with multiple testing, uh, you know, corrected. Uh, you know, two caveats I want to point out is like there's a different sequencing depth. So for the 21 cell line tissues, uh, we have roughly about, you know, half a billion rates, four, uh, 500 million rates per tissue, but there's variations, uh, you know, like uh, so, so, you know, sometimes you need to interpret, so not, not finding, so basically, uh, you know, not finding a interaction of uh, finding a, a contact does not mean it's not exist. It can mean just that uh, the data are not, uh, you know, uh, dense enough. And the other is about the current resolution. Right now, it's uh, only at 40 kb. So if you have uh, several SNPs within the same 40 kb, we can, cannot take them, uh, take them apart. Uh, but you know, we're getting at a much lower, uh, much higher resolution, which, you know, smaller bean size. Uh, so, you know, with that, uh, thank, uh, I'd like to thank my postdoc who did all the work and uh, been running and generated all the data. I'm happy to be cool. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And here's the URL. We you know, use it and uh, we update and maintain. And if you have information, you know, just drop me a note. Okay. Yun, thank you very much. Okay, we probably have time for one or two fast questions. Um, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box or use the Q&A box. Um, while we're waiting, there's no questions right this moment. I'll, let me ask one. So I was really struck by the fact, by well, one of the slides where you showed the lack of overlap between genomic proximity to a GWAS hit and what you get with, in, with a three-dimensional view, a high C view. Yeah. Um, and it really seems just, I guess, uh, this is something that our analyses must take into account uh, immediately. Is yeah. that a correct interpretation for, for the people that do this kind of work? Yes. That you get a really different look at what's going on if you look at the three-dimensional view versus uh, a one-dimensional view. I totally agree. I mean, like, uh, again, you know, I think a lot of, uh, at least a large proportion of the cartilage was just assigned SNPs to nearest genes. So you see enrichment, you know, like uh, of the GWAS catalog, uh, you know, gene assignment for, for those SNPs, uh, a much larger proportion, you know, at least, you know, double the number of what uh, I see here. So if you compare uh, oops, uh, this column, those two columns, you know, like, uh, the percentages are much higher. Uh, yep. uh, so you need to be extremely cautious regarding, you know, like how, which genes we assign them. You know, like if you just basically assign the SNP to the wrong gene and, and then you do a pathway gene side enrichment, you're getting junk. Yep. And then second, there's no other question, but just let me ask the second one real fast. So it's pretty clear from these data that um, you have to do something that's at least to some extent tissue specific. That if you are interested in a brain disease and you look at liver, it doesn't really help. Right. Um, th the second question, I guess the, the cor corollary of that is to what extent do we have to look at specific subcell types within a tissue, <laughs> especially for something as complicated as brain? Do you have any intuition on that yet? Excellent question. So we are uh, we're generating data on that, but you know I, I don't have a good sense. I mean all my sense are from you know RNA seq data. So if the uh, you know expression levels are quite different in different you know uh, types of uh, you know neurons and different types of brain tissues, and then you know we expect you know like uh, the the structure to be different. But you know like uh, people are most familiar with TAD, and we know TADs are quite conserved. So you know there are different levels. But uh, you know uh, and uh, the, uh, we ha we don't have have, uh, you know, enough high density, you know, interact uh, high C data to to be confident to say at the interaction level, like looking at the 10 kb or 40 kb, you know, beans and uh, look at their 3D contact to see to say that they are very tissue specific. Uh, but I, I believe, I mean, that this is my belief, just to make clear that uh, I think uh, at that level they must be different. And then as, uh, currently with the data we have, uh, what we you know found the most uh, uh, encouraging is this concept I highlighted the fire. So they are tissue specific in contrast to right. that, which are you know like uh, not very tissue specific. So they are I think uh, like uh, uh, conserved as the temporal you know like a functional units. It, it probably will still be at, uh, at a very concise level uh, rather than, you know, interaction. Interactions are more case by case, uh, contact. Yep. Uh, but okay. I think I totally agree. Good. Yeah, thank you so much for the, for the talk. And um, for, the, for the people, if you have a question for Yun that, that occurs to you later, please email it to me and I'll connect you up and to make sure that we can uh, get the question answered. 
Okay, so Yuna stopped sharing. Kyoko, if you could turn your camera back on and screen share. Yeah. We'll go to the second talk. Yun, thank you so much. Okay, next, um, Kyoko Watanabe is a, is a grad student with Daniela Postuma in, in Amsterdam, and she's been working hard on this wonderful resource called FUMA, which she will talk to us about. So, Kyoko, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Patrick, and organizing a very nice meeting. Um, so today I'm going inter to uh, introduce about web application named FUMA, which I developed to annotate, um, I quickly annotate uh, zero-summary uh, zero statistics to obtain biological insights. So I'm going to start with brief background and rationals why we end up with making FUMA and um, also a bit more detail what FUMA does with some examples and I'll end with some of the recent updates and also the coming updates. So I believe most of you have seen this Manhattan plot which is Schizophrenia PGC2 published in 2014 um, where they uh, reported more than hundreds of zeros risk loci. And since last year, the UK Biobank genotype was released, more and more zeros have been published, and lots of phenotypes have reported more than 50 or even hundreds of risk loci. But our primary goal in the zeros field was not just to identify genomic lesions, which are associated with lots of different types of phenotypes, but also to understand biological mechanisms behind the human diseases and complex traits. And to get there from zero summary statistics, you have to answer several questions. The first thing, the, first, the most important thing to, is to identify the potential cause of variance, which might have a direct effect to the function of protein or can affect the expression of genes through regulatory elements. And by identifying those causal variants, you can link them to the genes which are affected by uh, the zero risk loci. And the last thing you want to check is where those genes are expressed or what's the pathways which are involved in the phenotypes. And by answering these questions, you can start building a hypothesis that can be tested in the biological lab to further um, confirm your findings from zeros. But as you can imagine, doing all of this is not straightforward, mainly due to LD. So I'm gonna show you two example loci from schizophrenia. So this is one of, uh, one of them. And uh, if you are lucky, uh, the number of genes overlapping with this loci is relatively small. And especially in this locus, the top SNP is located right above near 137. And this gene has been the primary interest in this locus for the schizophrenia. But even if you have to cover all the genes, the number of genes you have to follow up is uh, still feasible. But it's often the case that there are so many genes overlapping with the risk locus. And as an example, in this region, there are uh, more than 10 genes that can be potentially uh, affected by this region. And in this case, um, it's hard to further prioritize SNPs or genes purely based on the zero summary statistics. So you have to start um, integrating with external data source. Um, for example, you can first look for uh, the coding SNPs. And in this region, there are three coding SNPs with, with a high cut score, which means those SNPs are higher in the and located on each of three genes. And you can also look for EQTLs. And in this region, there are two types of EQTLs in the brain, and one of them is affecting this gene, another one is affecting this gene. But as you can imagine, uh, EQTL analysis is also affected, uh, affected by LD. So all of these SNPs show a significant association with the expression of one of the gene, but that might be just because those are in LD with um, the actually functional SNPs. So you can further annotate uh, the Guillaume B score, for example, and there are several SNPs with high score. That means those SNPs uh, have higher potential of being involved in some kind of regulatory elements. And finally, um, nowadays more and more data is becoming available for 3D chromatin interaction, um, as Dr. Lee just, uh, just presented. So there was one significant high C interaction in the brain for this region, where one of the end is overlapping with some of the significant SNPs, and the other end was overlapping with transcription start site of these genes. Uh, which suggesting the potential functional association between these two regions that can affect um, the expression of this gene. 
and putting it all together by uh, integrating the different types of data source, you can start prioritizing um, the SNPs and also the genes that you can use for the further follow up. And to just to summarize the steps that you have to take uh, for the post sequence annotation, the first thing you have to do is correct for ID to identify independently SNPs and to define the genomic risk growth site. And once you get, once you define the risk growth site, uh, the next step is to annotate the functional consequence of SNPs within the risk growth site uh, to see if there is any exonic SNPs or splicing sites. But as you know, uh, more than 90% of GWAS findings are known to uh, be located in the non-coding regions. Um, just knowing that you have lots of internic or intergenic SNPs doesn't really help you to further prioritize SNPs. Um, so you uh, need to further annotate uh, functional information at the SNP level. Uh, for example, you can annotate the deleteriousness score, such as CAT score, and the legume, uh, uh, sorry, uh, regulatory elements, including EQ tails and legume DB, and also the genetic data, uh, such as open chromatin status from roadmap and encode. And by using these functional information at the SNP level, um, you can start linking SNPs to the genes. And then once you get the list of genes that might be affected by uh, the GWAS risk loci, the final step you would want to take is to check the tissue-specific expression of those genes and also the enrichment in uh, the gene sets or pathways. Uh, but as you can imagine, doing all of this is a lot of manual work. You have to download the different types of data sources and install the different softwares, which also involves a lot of formatting of the data. And to solve this problem, we developed a web application. Um, so I basically automized the four steps I showed in the previous slides into uh, the single platform as a web application. So there is no dependency in the local. So the only thing you need to prepare is a zero summary statistics. And the website is freely available from this link. So please feel free to play around. And uh, this is the, the brief overview of what FUMA does in the suburb. So there are two main processes. The first one is a SNP to gene, starting from zero summary statistics. Uh, it perform, uh, uh, performs a correction for LD and maps SNPs to the gene. The final output is the list of genes which are mapped from functional SNPs. And the second process is a gene to found where you can check uh, the expression of genes in the several tissue types and also the enrichment in the gene sets and pathways. And uh, uh, in the SNP to gene process, we also perform magma internally, so you can also get the gene based p value. And one of the advantages of the web application is that we provide a lot of different types of interactive visualization, which helps you to quickly understand your results. Um, so before I go into a bit more detail what uh, snp 2 uh, does, I would like to show uh, quickly how you can submit the job. And so if you go to the FUMA uh, website, first you need to register, and once you log in, then go to the snp 2 gene page. The, as I said before, the only thing you need to prepare is the GWA summary statistics. So you can upload a file from here. And there are lots of uh, different types of parameters, but most of them have a default, uh, default value. So you can just skip all of them if you are just trying the first time. And then scroll down all the way to the bottom where you can put the titles and then hit the submit the job. That will upload your summary statistics to the server and push your job to the queue. And then normally, it, it really depends on the number of snips you have, but the normal job finish uh, between 20 to 1 hour. Uh, sorry, 20 minutes to one hour. And then once the process is done, you will get the email from Puma. And when you go back to your account, you can see all the job you have submitted. And by clicking go to the results, uh, you can start browsing your results. Yeah, so I'm gonna go through a bit more detail what Puma does in the SNP to gene uh, process. So starting from zero summary statistics, the first one is to identify independent significant SNPs and also define the genomic risk of SI. Um, to do so, FUMA performs double cramping. So the first cramping is the normal cramping, as you know, with uh, the R square 0.6 and p-value as uh, not wise significant, p-value 5 times 10 to the minus 8, which defines the independent significant SNPs. 
And you can also change these parameters when you submit the job. And in this plot, the independent significant SNPs are the ones with these black circles. So there are four of them. But as you can see, the sum of them are still uh, located close to each other, especially when you put R square high. So then the second clamping is to clamp the independent significant SNPs at the R square 0.1, which defines the lead SNPs. So in this region, uh, in this example, there are two lead SNPs which are in uh, color in purple. And that means these two independent significant SNPs are not independent uh, at R square 0.1 from one of these lead SNPs. And the final step is to merge uh, physically overlapping LED blocks or less, uh, the distance is less than the maximum distance you defined, and that defines the genomic risk growth side. And each locus is represented by the top lead SNPs. And in this region, the SNPs which are colored, those are in LED with one of the independent significant SNPs at uh, R square 0.6. And all these SNPs will be passed to the second step, which is annotation of those SNPs. And so FUMA performs ANOVA to obtain functional consequence of the SNPs and also annotates CAT score, the Guillaume DV score, open chromatin states for um, 127 uh, cell types from load map and encode, and EQTLs, and also the high C. And you can also select specific tissue types or data set for EQTL and high C. And the final step in a SNP to gene is a gene mapping. So there are three types of gene mapping available in the FUMA. The first one is a positional mapping, as you can imagine from the name. This is purely based on the distance between SNPs to the gene. So in this example, these two genes, one of them are located within the risk growth site, and the other one is located uh, close to the risk growth site, and the distance is less than uh, the certain window you defined. So those two genes will be mapped. But you can also specify which types of SNPs you want to use for mapping. So, for example, if you only want to map exonic SNPs, you can also select that, and this gene won't be mapped anymore. And for the EQTL mapping, um, the firma annotates significant EQTLs for the tissue types you selected, and then uh, those SNPs will be mapped to the gene whose expression is affected by uh, those SNPs. And before I go into uh, the chromatin induction mapping, I just want to mention that you can um, also filter SNPs based on other functional annotations prior to the gene mapping. So for example, you can set the cut score threshold to only use high data in SNPs, or you can do the same for the Guillaume DV score and the open chromatin status. And you can set these filtering parameter for each gene mapping separately. Yeah, so the third mapping is chromatin induction mapping, which is a bit more complicated than others. Um, so what we are aiming here is to find the uh, enhancer promoter interactions. So what FUMA does is to first, um, first overlap the one end of significant interaction with a risk growth side, and other end of the interaction needs to be overlapped with the transcription start site of genes. So in this example, this interaction will be mapped to these two genes, and then this interaction will be mapped to this gene, but this gene won't be mapped because the transcription start site is not overlapping this interaction. And uh, the high C measures the interaction between two genomic regions, but that doesn't mean uh, uh, the interaction, the significant interaction doesn't always mean there's a fun functional interaction. They could be just located close to each other, so to avoid those false positives, you can further filter interaction based on the predicted enhancer and promoter from roadmap. So when you activate the filtering based on enhancer, the FUMA annotates the enhancer to one of the end of significant interaction, and which is also overlapping with the risk growth side. And so FUMA only uses that kind of interaction. So this interaction won't be used anymore. So this, only these two things will be mapped. And when you activate the filtering based on promoter, um, the FUMA annotate promoters to the other end of the interaction, which also needs to be overlapped with transcription start site of the gene. So in this case, this gene won't be mapped anymore, but only this gene will be uh, prioritized. 
Um, yeah, so that was the Jima pings. And if you go to your, uh, your account and go to the result page, you can see a lot of different types of plots. So you can see the zeros, uh, genome wide plots, and the summary of the, each locus. And then all of the annotation results will be available as a table, which you can query. You can also download as a plain text so you can do further analysis. And you can also create uh, the regional plot with annotation together. And this is one of the examples. Um, so this plot shows the zeros p value at the top and, and genes where the mapped genes are highlighted in red. And you have cut score, the ground DB score, and EQ tails all together. And if I recall the example I showed in the beginning of this presentation, that was one of the uh, uh, risk loci in the schizophrenia. There are three data scoring SNPs mapped to three different genes, and there are two types of EQTLs in the brain affecting the expression of these two genes. So by creating those kind of plot, you can uh, easily see uh, which SNPs are affecting what genes. And this plot is interactive in a web application, so you can zoom in, and by clicking one of the SNPs, it shows the, the, uh, the information of that SNPs in the table. And now uh, when you perform the chromatin interaction mapping in the FUMA, uh, it also creates the circus plot per chromosome. And this is the zoomed in example for the neuroticism meta-analysis um, recently performed from our lab. So in this plot, it shows Manhattan plot in the more layers, and then the region highlighted blue are the risk loci. And inside of the circle, the orange links are high ceilings, and then green links are EQTLs. And the genes map either by EQTLs or high C are labeled here. And then you can uh, see the chromatin induction can map SNPs to the distal genes compared to the EQTLs. But especially in this region, um, we found a cross loci interaction which are uh, uh, connecting the two independent risk loci. So these two risk loci are actually pointing pointing to a single gene, and this gene might be the potential interest for uh, the neurocytism. Yeah, so just quickly to recap, in the gene to funk you can create the uh, gene expression heat map for the different types of tissues, and you can test the enrichment in the tissue-specific gene, and also the gene sets and the pathways. And you can uh, internally pass the genes which are mapped in SNP to gene process, but you can also upload the list of genes you're interested in manually. Yeah, and finally, I, won't like to, I would like to share some of the uh, recent updates. So in, uh, in the last February, there was a major update for some of the data. So mainly, uh, the main update was I added several EQTL data. So uh, currently, both GTX v6 and v7 are available now, and there, were, there are several other blood and brain EQTLs. And one thing I need to um, uh, note, uh, I need to warn you is that this is how it looks like when you select the tissue type for EQT mapping. So the first uh, option is that you can select all, but since I kept GTX V6 EQTL to be able to replicate your old results, when you click the all, that means that's gonna include both EQ, uh, GTX V6 and V7. So I really recommend you to manually select um, which version you want to use. And if you uh, scroll down, you can see there's a GTX V7, and GTX V6 comes after the V7. So if you, um, if you want to use a V6, uh, please scroll down uh, uh, all the way down to uh, this, this box. And also, uh, I added some gene expression data. So again, the both GTX V6 and V7 are now available. And I also added the brain span data, which is for uh, development of human brain. So as an example, you can test the specificity for uh, the specific ages of the brain. Yeah, and finally, there are some coming updates planned. Um, so now I'm uh, uh, preparing the UK reference for FUMA which will be available by the end of this month, hopefully. And then I'm uh, creating some single cell RNA data too, so that you can also test the cell type specificity, not only the tissue type specificity. And uh, we are planning to work on to improve the chromatin interaction mapping by incorporating uh, several other data, such as ChIP-seq. 
And also, uh, in the next update, I will add the option to, um, that you can uh, publish your results online so that other users can also query your results. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, would like to appreciate uh, the Daniela Postman, who is my promoter, and also the support from a CTG member. And um, if you have any problem using Puma, please feel free to contact me from this email. And any questions or suggestions from the new data would be appreciated. And you can also post from this Google group. Thank you very much. Okay, Kyoko, thank you so much. And I think uh, for anyone who's tried to do this themselves, um, I think for the, the 2004 PGC paper, it took us probably a year to do the work that can be done now in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so I think this is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I, also, I also really like the capacity to publish. And so yes. what yeah. I think we're going to do from the PGC for now on yeah. Like if, if for the schizophrenia paper, for instance, we're going to publish the FUMA look at the data as well. Yeah. So people yeah, can then go straight to that and, and explore the data themselves. Yeah, That's a fantastic be. option. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, let's get some questions. Um, there is one right now. Um, can you see the Q&A box or shall I read the question uh, to you? Should I stop the share? No, keep sharing. Just down at the bottom, hit the Q&A. Yeah, but when I'm sharing, I cannot find the Q&A. <laughs> Okay, nice. uh, I'll read the question. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I got it, I got it. Okay, oh, David yes. Curtis has a question. Uh, yeah, I noticed you use a cut score to look at the genes around MIA-137, but does cut work on RNA genes? Do we need more special annotation for these? Oh, um, well, I didn't actually use a cut score to specify MIA 137. That was just one example that I showed. Um, yeah, let me go back. And while you're doing that, I'll just comment. Microarrays are tough. They're really small, and you know there's a yeah. lot of floppiness in how they bind. And, and uh, a base pair change may have, may can sometimes have zero difference. It's it's yeah. really tricky. Yeah, and I think so that the people start looking for this gene is just because the hit was. You know, just above this gene, and it wasn't really based on the cut score. And uh, the cut score I showed was here, and that was not uh, for the microRNA. I, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know if I understand the. Yeah, I think I think CAD score is is almost by definition for protein coding variation. Yes, it, yeah, more yeah. the regulome stuff that gets you at the other types. Yeah. I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's another question, which is uh, very inspiring. FUMA is a beautiful work. Thank you very um, much. Where do we find the circus plot in FUMA? Oh, yeah. Um, it would be nice if I can share. But so if I can show the one of the tables. So the circus plot, I'm sorry, the plot is really small. So if you go to the results page, and they, when you perform the uh, chromatin interaction mapping, there's a tab for chromatin interaction. And if you go to that tab and scroll down to the bottom, there's a, the, uh, the circle spot for each chromosome listed there. And if you can't find, please send me the email. I can also insert you. Right. And, and one of the things that's pretty cool about many of these graphs, which I, I don't think Yoko mentioned, is many of them are actually dynamic. So you oh, can yeah, scroll yeah. in and scroll out and things change almost instantly. It's, it's really pretty. It's a very yeah. useful browser. Yeah, thank you. Okay, other questions? I have one. Um, how, yeah. how much traffic does FUMA get? Um, so the average job per day is now it's like 30, but it really depends on the day. It's like it gets busy. Um, from Wednesday to Friday. I don't know why, but yeah, the weekend is uh, it's uh, really to be uh, open. And uh, yeah, but okay. the, currently the power job is only five. So when it's get really busy, you might have to wait to finish the job, yeah. Okay, yeah. another question came up. Is it possible to make a circos plot of all chromosomes together? Um, yeah, it's possible. It just doesn't do the FUMA, but there is a GitHub repository on my account where I showed some example how to do that. So, yeah, I don't have a link over here, but it would be nice if you can share. But yeah, if you can find me on the GitHub, there's a repo for the Cycle Sport. Okay, 
Another question in the chat box is, is it possible to add interactive Manhattan plots? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of interaction you are looking for, but the problem for the Manhattan Pro is like the data points is so large to make interactively uh, is a bit, bit high because it makes web slower. But um, yeah, if you can specify you what kind of interactive function you're looking for, I might be able to consider. So it, it sounds like through the Google group, you, you do accept feature requests. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. If you have okay. a lot of data you want me to be in, include or any software, it would be uh, very nice to post in the Google group. Excellent. So I guess that's the answer to the question. So uh, if, if, if you were to um, specify exactly what you meant by interactive Manhattan plot, what features you'd like to see from a click yeah. on a particular yeah. area that might yeah. be useful. Yeah, then I will consider, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank um, Kyoko and Yun so much for giving these two great talks about a couple of fantastic outputs. It's interesting that each of these summarize literally billions of data points in a way that's very useful and highly, highly informative for the interpretation of GWAS findings. And I think these are things that we need to get into our analyses uh, urgently. This is, this is super important stuff. And I, I deeply appreciate as a user of both resources, uh, how much time and effort you've put into giving us uh, a quality tool. So thank you so much, uh, both for giving these talks today and also for the huge amount of work that's gone into this. Thank you very much. Okay, that's it for today. And again, I'm, I'm sure uh, as for all 50 odd people on this call, we thank the speakers for, um, their, uh, for their talks today. And again, for making these resources. Thank you. Thank you. That's it, everybody. Bye.